Good evening. Jim asked if there was more announcements, and I didn't think till later. Violet's not feeling well tonight with a, with a headache, so keep her in your prayers as well, please. <clears throat> So this morning I preached about an introduction to Luke. I got some feedback on a couple things, and uh, I really appreciate that. I, I hope uh, whoever's standing up here, you don't just take what they say because they're standing up here, but it's because it's the Word of God and it's right. And, and uh, so I had a question about uh, one of the things that I said. And uh, one of the things I said was that, that uh, the Gospel of Luke was the longest book in the New Testament. And... Uh, Strictly speaking, Matthew has more chapters, but, but what I meant was the, like the actual length of the document, because the chapters can be broken wherever they're broken, but uh, Luke has 1,151 words, whereas Matthew has a little less, 1,071 words. So, appreciate you all watching for me. Uh, another little interesting tidbit about that, um, Luke wrote more uh, than Paul, if you take that count of words, through the New Testament, I would assume that that would be Paul. If you just get quiz me and say, well, who wrote more of the New Testament than anyone else? Well, it's obviously Paul, but that's not true. Luke, Luke wrote a little bit more, quite a bit more. So, as Jim said, we started a, a, a series on Luke, but I actually apparently started two series. So tonight we're going to continue our series on Revelation. I, I suppose I'm making it too hard for myself, but... That's what I'm doing. So, tonight we're going to continue on our series about this uh, Old Testament keys to the book of Revelation. So, all these different Old Testament passages that can shed light if we study the book of Revelation. Or, to put it a different way, if we just go and read the book of Revelation, we come in to, to see these crazy visions with dragons and all kinds of weird stuff that doesn't sound familiar to us and it and it can be a, a fertile playground for our imagination and, and false doctrine and all sorts of things and so in this series i'm picking out some of what uh, seem to be some of the weirdest visions at least that strike me that way and seem unfamiliar <clears throat> and then trying to find in the old testament where these things are are rooted and then looking at these old testament things and then seeing where they're at revelation to kind of poke holes, to poke some light into that dark box that is Revelation, or to, to give us some thoughts for that. Last time I talked about this idea of Jingle Bells, written um, in the 1850s, this familiar song, Jingle Bells. Then 100 years later, Jingle Bell Rock was written, and you can kind of see how uh, they're similar but different, and, and it's sort of a similar concept uh, where here in the New Testament we, we draw from uh, some of these Old Testament references. Of course, it can be more difficult. We, we can s relate to those things, even though they're, they're, you know, 1850s is a long time ago, and we don't drive around in sleds and all that. We can understand that, but it's a little bit harder with some of these things from the ancient times and different part of the world. So, as I said, we're mainly thinking about connections between the Old Testament and Revelation. And I shared this, this chart last time. It shows Connections between Old Testament books and Revelation, and there's some large connections in Isaiah and Ezekiel, Daniel, Jeremiah, Psalms and Exodus, and, and quite a bit in Zechariah as well. So, let's dig into some of these here tonight. We'll look through some, some items from the chapter 6 through 10, and I've decided to draw on these four tonight for our study. <clears throat> We have this concept of these horses, you know, the four horsemen of the apocalypse we sometimes talk about. This uh, idea of being sealed on their forehead and uh, all the kinds of ideas that get brought out about that. Uh, some scenes with locusts coming and, and these horrific scenes with different faces and hair and all kinds of descriptions. And this, this idea of, of eating a scroll. I, I haven't eaten a scroll lately. It sounds like an unpleasant thing, but that's something we see in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, in this idea of these visions. So let's look at this idea of horses. You know, we see in uh, Zechariah uh, chapters 1 and, and, and 8, we have uh, a series of, 
of eight visions in Zechariah. And, and the sort of this, this bookends that we'll have, uh, for, uh, where we see horses being used in this way. So let's look at Zechariah chapter one, starting in verse eight. It says there, I saw in the night and behold a man riding on a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen and behind him were red, sorrel and white horses. Then I said, what are these, my Lord? The angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. So the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered, These are they whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. And they answered the, the angel of the Lord, uh, who was standing among the myrtle trees, and said, We have patrolled the earth, and behold, all the earth is at rest. Then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, against which you have been angry these 70 years? And so if we think of the context here where the, the folks have been recently released from captivity, they're looking back to the time when Daniel had, had foretold through God's uh, Holy Spirit, where he was able to tell them that it would be 70 years of captivity. Now that they've returned and they're still having a hard time, they're struggling with neighbors and conflicts and things. So in this first vision, we see these horses riding out, and their job is to patrol the earth. But it seems that uh, the horsemen are not you know, literally horses with guys on them, people, but uh, we might say angels, some, some sort of, of God's divine servants who are able to you know, miraculously patrol the entire earth in this way and report to God. I think the idea that we're to derive from that is that God is in control and God is all seeing and all, all knowing. And the big picture is here for these folks that they're, they're still not really obeying God. Yeah, they've, they've come back from captivity, but they're once again getting involved in things that they shouldn't be doing. And so they're still having trouble. They're not being blessed by God the way they would expect. They're mistreating their neighbors and their countrymen, hence their continued problems. And so, in this series of eight visions, that's the first one with these horses, but then there's a, at the end of that series, there's the eighth vision, which has some additional imagery, which is similar here. He says again, Zechariah 6, 1, Again, I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, four chariots came out from between two mountains. And the mountains were mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black horses. The third, white horses. And the fourth chariot, dappled horses. All of them strong. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my lord? And the angel answered and said to me, These are going out to the four winds of heaven, after presenting themselves before the Lord of all the earth. So again, we see this, this idea of these, these horses, maybe angels of some sort, or patrolling the earth on God's behalf. And again, they help to demonstrate that idea that God is all-knowing, all-powerful, in control of everything using these, these servants. Now, in Revelation, we have horses coming as a result of the, uh, the seals that are opened there in chapter 6, and those seals are being opened, and it's bringing these different judgments into the world. So when we encounter this in, in, Rome, in Revelation 6, verse 2, it should seem somewhat familiar from these other passages. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come! And out came another horse, bright red, its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. And here we, we see the, these colors of the horses, the, the red, it seems to be representing blood. We have this idea of slaying people and their swords, this idea of warfare going on in the judgment. And then verse 5, when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse. 
and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And then in the next verse, it goes on to talk about the shortages and the famine of war. So this black seems to represent uh, the famine that comes in war and all of the shortages and that sort of thing. And if we look at verse 8, we see another horse. And I looked, and behold, a pale green horse. Now, your Bible might say pale horse. But this is the word for green, like other passages talk about green grass, and this is the word. So think of like a zombie green, gross, dead body color. It's gross. And I looked, and behold, a pale green horse. And one seated on it was named Death, and Hades followed after him, or the grave. And authority was granted to them over a fourth of the earth to kill by the sword and by famine and by pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. So this is a, a gross colored horse representing the, the destruction and death that comes with, with uh, war, which is these judgments that are being envisioned happening to people. So John here is re reimagining these horsemen that we read about in Zechariah. And he's using them here in this setting as instruments of God's judgment on the earth. So what about this deal of having some sort of seal on your forehead? If we look at Ezekiel chapter 9, we can see an example of that, which we'll later see in Revelation as well. Revelation 9, starting in verse second half of verse 3. And he called to the man clothed in linen, who had the writing case at his waist. And the Lord said to him, Pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in it. So, uh, you know, the good folks, the people who are upset at the bad things going on. This is a scene that's sort of reminiscent of the Passover in that these people are being uh, judged the unrighteous people are being judged, but the righteous people are being protected by having this mark on their forehead. You know, of course, in the Passover, they had the, the blood on the doorpost and all of that. It's a similar concept here. And it's interesting that this word that's, that's uh, put a mark on the forehead, that Hebrew word for mark is actually, uh, it's actually the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's, it's sort of like our letter T in terms of its sound. But uh, at that time, the alphabet, it was written, it was sort of looked like an X. And so many commentators have pointed out, you know, that this might have something to do, later echoes of the cross. Um, the first letter in Greek of the word for Christ is, looks like an X as well. Um, or thinking of the alpha and the omega. Omega is there because it's the last letter of the alphabet, as well as the, the ta, this letter. In Hebrew, is the last letter. So... It's interesting, it's not just a mark, it's actually this, this letter, this specific letter. But if we look at uh, Revelation chapter 7, starting in verse 2, we see some similar things here. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So this bizarre, weird thing about sealing your forehead is a little less bizarre when we've seen it previously in the Old Testament. So in the midst of these judgments that are coming upon the earth portrayed in chapter 6 here in Revelation, God's people are going to be preserved. The righteous saints get this seal this mark on their forehead. Now, I don't think neither uh, Ezekiel nor John here in Revelation are trying to talk about literal, you know, some sort of tattoo or something in your head. I mean, these are visions that they're having in the Spirit. But this is an indication that God is able to, to see us in the spiritual realm and know who his people are, he knows who we are. Our hope of eternal life will never be forgotten or overlooked by God. God isn't going to misplace, oh, I don't know, are they a Christian? I can't, there's so many people. That's not, that's not God. He is all-knowing, and this is sort of an image to help us think about how he can recognize us, that there's the sense in which we're marked. 
even in the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, it says there, and, and it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So one of the blessings we have from the Holy Spirit is this idea that as we are baptized and saved, that there's a sense in which we are sealed and, and marked, and we have this pledge or this guarantee through the Holy Spirit. God recognizes us. Don't understand exactly how that works, but we're going to trust that by faith. In Ezekiel 11, we see some, some language here. Ezekiel 11, verses 19 through 20, talking about our heart. It says, And I will, I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put in them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. And so while we don't have miraculous spiritual gifts, there is a sense that we as the temple of God who are being built up as living stones have the spirit dwelling in our hearts of flesh. Well, let's turn our attention to the locusts imagery from both the Old and New Testament as we see those things brought into Revelation. So these images of locusts really have their roots in the book of Joel. And it's, uh, there's some debate, and you can have the debate within yourself as you read Joel to understand what, what is the context that he's writing. And it's not real clear what time, what the date. There's not uh, indications of various kings to like, nail down exactly when Joel was writing or what his context was. And, and so it's, it's not super clear whether he's writing about literal locusts, which of course is a bad problem in an agricultural society or any society we all eat, right? <laughs> if you have uh, lo uh, locusts or any insects or pests that come in and destroy your crops, that's devastating. And that might be what he's talking about. But it also could be a poetic way to describe uh, soldiers that are in an invading army that are coming in to invade the land. But either way, wh whichever view you take on that, the point is that God is in charge and God uses uh, you know, other nations or other people to, to es establish his will and to get things done. So in Joel chapter 1, verse 4, describing some of these things with the locusts coming, he says, What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses. So here's sounded pretty straightforward at first, but now we're, these locusts look like horses. And, and like war horses as they run. As with the rumbling of chariots, they leap on the tops of the mountains like the crackling of a flame, a fire devouring the stubble like a powerful army drawn up for battle. So again, these, these locusts are representing God's judgment on the people for whatever rebellious attitudes they had at that time. And similarly, in Revelation 9, we see from the, the bottomless pit here, Revelation 9, verse 2, it says, He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the, smoke, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions on the earth. So the fifth trumpet in this context in Revelation, there's these different trumpets that are uh, being blown, and then different uh, judgments come as a result of those trumpets. But that ushered in this bottomless pit being open, and then moving on to verse 4, they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. There's their seal again. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. So God brings judgment, and using this imagery of these of these uh, locusts, but of course he's preserving the eternal life 
of, of his people. And I say eternal life because, of course, things can happen to us, but what we're promised is our eternal life. We're never going to lose the promises we have of God in the eternal. Verse 6, And in those days people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. Describing these horrible judgments. Verse 7, in, a, in appearance, the locusts were like horses. Sounds familiar. They're prepared for battle. On their heads were what uh, looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces. Their hair like women's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses, horses rushing into battle. Of course, these are not exactly the things we read about in Joel, but we have uh, some echoes of Joel for sure. So this is in the context of the seven trumpets being blown in succession. Uh, these are bizarre images, but we can recognize the connection to what was said in Joel. And the point is that God will work his judgment. He's all-powerful, and he can use any means to get his work done, any people, even if we look at that people as evil, God can use them to work his judgment. So eating a scroll. I haven't eaten a scroll lately, but uh, this is the image that's used here. So as, as often happens with the prophets, uh, God calls Ezekiel, and he asks him to bring the word of God against the rebellious people. So Ezekiel 2, verse 3 and he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. So I, I should also point out this Son of Man word. We've talked a lot about that last time. Uh, in this context, that's just a, a way to describe a human. Um, of course, in, in our other discussion, we talked about how the way Daniel uses it, and it's sort of referring to that Messiah figure which is, I think, what part of the way that Jesus was able to get away with using that so often. People were kind of confused. Well, which way does he mean it? You know. So in this case, uh, Ezekiel is being addressed as a son of man, just as a person. Moving on to the next verse, though. Uh, verse 8. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Be not rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. And when I looked... Behold, a hand was stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. So he's asking him to eat a scroll. Verse 10, And he spread it before me, and it had writing on the front and on the back. And there were written on it words of lamentation and mourning and woe. So this is the words of this are not a particularly pleasant thing to read or to, to have as a burden to have to convey to others. So you would think, if you're thinking about eating a scroll, I mean, that's difficult to eat literally, but even the content of that scroll would be difficult to take in. Chapter 3, verse 1. And he said to me, Son of man, eat whatever you find here. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he gave me this scroll to eat. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly with this scroll that I give you, and fill your stomach with it. Then I ate it, and it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. So that seems kind of strange. He's eating this scroll, and it's sweet. It even seems strange in terms of the words, that these are difficult words. Uh, but perhaps, uh, you know, we're to think of Psalm 19, verse 10, where it talks about how the word of God is sweet as honey. Uh, perhaps the idea that... Uh, Ezekiel, it's a good thing that he's taking this in and he's, he's intending to obey and do God's word, so that's, that's a good thing. So in that sense, perhaps things are sweet here. But verse 4, And he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. So deliver this message to them. But as we go on down to, to verse 14, later in the context here, the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went to in bitterness, in the heat of my spirit, the hand of the Lord being strong upon me. So 
As he first ate that scroll, it was sweet. But then upon reflection and upon working through that, it becomes more bitter. Perhaps the, the task of delivering God's word and the difficult things that are in that changed his feelings about how that, how that was. And we see some similar imagery here in Revelation. Revelation chapter 10, looking at verse 8 of Revelation 10. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter. But in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. Makes us think of what we just read. Verse 10. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. So, again, some of the same imagery we had in Ezekiel and Revelation about this scroll. And so the scroll, I think we're to understand, is the word of God. It's the, the, word, the message on that scroll is the idea. You know, so we're told to take that in. Uh, where Ezekiel is and, and John is here. The expectation is that it will be uh, difficult, as you imagine what that would be. But then it, it seems sweet. So uh, it could be the idea that we, we love the word of God. We love the Bible. It's a good thing. But sometimes it can be really hard uh, sharing with the, the message with others when situations are difficult. You know, the, the judgment that, that is part of the gospel message. It's good news for those who accept it, but for those who don't, it's, it's judgment and condemnation, and that's an unpleasant topic. And God is love, certainly, but he's also holy and will judge the unrighteous. God loved the world. And how much did he love the world? He loved the world so much that he gave his own son that we can have forgiveness of our sins. But, but, but how do we react to that? Do we care? Do we, do we take hold of that free gift and treat that as precious? Or do we say we don't care and we want to be busy with the things of the world? So God is going to react to our reaction as well. And the gospel message is urgent. People need to be saved. And you know, these horrible judgments that uh, are part of what we read in Revelation. You know, particularly the lake of fire in chapters 19 through 20 is repeatedly mentioned, this lake of fire for those that are unfaithful. We certainly don't don't want that for, for ourselves or for, for anyone. So we've talked about these, these four visions of the horses being sealed on the forehead, the locusts, and eating a scroll. So the the horses sort of represent that idea of God's judgment and, and his omniscience and omnipresence. And the seals are this idea of, of God's protection for his saints to have eternal life. And the locusts, again, are another symbol of judgment brought upon the wicked and unrighteous. And this idea of eating a scroll is taking in the word of God, which all of us need to do. We need to obey it. And live it, and, and there's going to be, you know, rocky roads with that in life, working through that. So, the overarching message, get right with God, we can take from that. You now, this is intended as a Bible study uh, prep tool to help us think about the book of Revelation. But as we uh, think about those lessons, I think uh, getting right with God is a message we can all take away from that. We need, we need God's protection. We need to be saved and have that seal that we read about. Uh, we need to avoid God's condemnation and all of those different judgment visions that we read about. We don't want that. We, we don't want the condemnation. We want to enjoy his promises and his rewards. We want to take in the word of God into our hearts and not just carry around a book, but to, to read it and, and understand it and learn and live it and share it. And, and there's going to be times where it's sweet and there's going to be times where it feels bitter. It's not always easy. So if there's anything we can do for you, uh, if you have some things you need to come to the church about to ask for prayers, or perhaps you've never obeyed the gospel, by all means, we want to assist you in that. Can we help you to uh, study the Bible or put on Christ in baptism? We invite you to consider that 
as we have the invitation here. We're going to sing a song. There's a great day coming. And that day is Judgment Day. It's a great day for Christ to return as the King and, you know, to to usher us and we'll meet him in the air and all that if we're right with God. Uh, but it's a horrible day if you're not right with God and uh, all of the judgment that will come upon upon you if that's the case. So let's get right with God. If we can help you, come as we stand and sing the song.